All right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Inspiration Hour for the month of April. We are excited for our lineup today. We have some amazing speakers. Um, we'll get started. Uh, my name is Tara Mastel. I work for Montana State University Extension in the Community Development Program. Um, we manage the, uh, we do rural community vitality work all throughout the state. We uh, run the Reimagining Rural Program. We help leaders in our towns uh, build their skills through the Big Sky Big Leadership Program. I'm joined today by my co-host, Jennifer Anderson. There she is in the Navy. And Jennifer is the extension agent in Rosebud and Treasure County. She lives in Forsyth and she is um, kind of the brainchild behind all of this. So uh, glad to have you with us, Jennifer. Um, so this Inspiration Hour is a series that we designed for this whole year, really looking at uh, helping rural leaders across the state solve some of their most pressing challenges or take advantage of some of their most pressing opportunities. And that's kind of what we're talking about today is opportunities. Um, we want to help you figure out the first step, like what do you do first? And how can, how can you um, reach out? Who can you reach out to across the state for help with whatever you want to do next? Um, we plan this inspiration hour series for the year of 2023 because we're moving our, our reimagining world program to the early part of 2024. So we wanted to have kind of this year long hot topics webinar series. And we've had some really great responses. Um, this one I think is our most highly attended or registered for one. We have a, about a hundred and a little over 140 people registered. So Jennifer, do you wanna talk a little bit about what we're talking about today? Sure. So thanks, Tara. Um, so as Tara said, I'm Jennifer Anderson. I'm the MSU Extension Agent in Rosebud and Treasure County is located in Forsyth. Um, have been involved in the Reimagining Rural Project since its inception. And super excited to have these inspiration hours. Um, as we've been going through the um, Reimagining Rural process in the series, we um, were very um, tried to be very keyed into what our community um, members and our participants wanted. So um, we just really wanted to have an ear to the ground to know what really matters to our small towns um, and moving forward and what kind of topics and things they thought were really important to them. And one topic that kept popping up was community events and festivals and um, community gatherings, events, festivals, county fairs, music festival, whatever. Um, it seems that we had um, a lot of questions, a lot of chatter, a lot of um, people had a burning desire to want to know more about how do you go about starting, planning, implementing, maintaining a successful community event um, festival. So, um, we are super excited to be able to host today's session because I think um, Tara has put together a great lineup that's going to um, touch on these items. And, and then once again, as always, if people have um, a desire to learn, know, learn more and know more, we'll try to accommodate and do um, plan another one or do something where we can bring more information and education out to folks and also uh, a way for people to share with each other, because we've also learned from this process that there's a lot of knowledge in the room, so to speak. And so um, we just want people to be able to share what's working for them um, as far across the board, whatever topic it is. So um, just super excited to be here, um, excited to be able to offer this and learn more from our presenters on how do you go about planning and implementing a festival event in your small town? Yep. Awesome. Okay. So just a little bit about the lineup. So we, we're going to have um, Cole Mannix from the Old Salt Festival talk first, and then Shinyi Chian from the University of Minnesota Tourism Center. And then we have um, Megan Sundy and Michelle Cushman. They have some grants available for these sorts of things. We're going to, after each speaker, we're going to have a time for questions. So um, be ready for that. And we're going to take the questions through the chat. So. 
with that, I am going to kick off. I'm going to just do a brief introduction of our first speaker, uh, Cole Mannix. He is a former 4-H'er. We are, <laughs> we are extension, and we're super proud to um, learn that he was a 4-H'er in the um, in his program at I think Powell County. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So um, Cole is a rancher. He started the Old Salt Co-op, with which is uh, they are selling meat from area ranchers that's raised, finished, and processed in Montana. They came up with this idea for this Old Salt Festival, which is celebrating all the things that we love, um, all of our strengths, things that we have right now, uh, Montana raised and grown food, music, ranching, and wild landscapes. Cole's family has been in the Blackfoot Valley since 1882. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Cole. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, can you hear me okay? All right. I'm going to try to share my screen here. It's going to be busy for a second. Can you see that okay? Yeah, looks great. Looks great. Well, I'm happy to be here. Um, I live in Helena and grew up in the Blackfoot Valley. My my mom and dad and my dad's um, two brothers and their spouses and my three of my siblings and three of my first cousins and their families all live on the ranch and operate it. I'm a city boy. I don't operate it, but uh, I'm a wannabe rancher. And uh, what I do full time now is is um, try to get old salt meat company um off and running and so as um as was mentioned i we wanted to diversify our markets and improve our markets and the goal is to return more value back to the stewardship of land and so we also knew as a company that the wholesale world is a pretty consolidated world from the packing to distribution to retail and so direct to consumer is where the, is the really the opportunity that we wanted to try to capture with this meat company. Not that we would not do wholesale, uh, but that direct to consumer was where the long term stability was. And so um, my own family's ranch has had a meat program, a local meat program, in addition to its commodity uh, market for about 15 years or so. We sell about 300 animals in the Missoula area, flathead area. And, but to grow bigger than that was quite a leap um, because all of a sudden you need to begin investing in more control over processing, um, a much more robust distribution infrastructure, and essentially the business gets more complex and the cost to manage that complexity increases um, faster than um, increases pretty fast. And that means that you kind of have to jump from 300 to 2000, 3000, if we wanted to market most of what we produce in Montana. And so instead of kind of growing our Mannix beef business alone, um, back in 2020, I reached out to partners, um, some other ranches that I knew and trusted. I knew their production model and we had worked together over the years. And I started writing a business plan and I started recruiting a team. And so Old Salt Co op um, is, a, is, is owned by a group of ranches. And it's governed by those ranches, and those ranches will share in its profits if it's successful. We're a startup still. And if we can grow demand like we hope to, um, we are built to grow the producers who own the business. So we're actually not a co op formally. We started that way, had to basically readjust because of fiscal and legal advice. And now we are Old Salt Co op LLC that basically has co op principles built into our operating agreement. Um, so I'll just give a really quick introduction because I think it matters to how we're thinking about this event, why we're holding it, and how we've approached approached it. Um, well, the first thing we did is we started a small restaurant about a year and a half ago in Helena, based on all local products, a super simple menu. The whole menu is in front of you on in this picture, and we wanted to test the market. We wanted to get a little enterprise going to just prove our concept a little bit. And so um, we leased this space and it's been, for the last year and a half, it's been a real bright spot because Helena has really shown up for it. Um, and it moves about 500 pounds of ground beef a week. And so that helps us with our with the meat side of things. And it, I think more importantly, it introduces us to 
120 people a day. Some of those people are the same people, but that traffic is, our goal is to have the people who come through the restaurant realize that we sell meat online. We, last July, we purchased a small processing facility. It's just custom exempt at the moment, uh, and, but it allowed us to kind of train a meat processing team and um, to get to know the business that we were about to really enter into at more scale. So we're in the process of renovating that to get you to USDA inspection and adding a slaughter facility, which it currently does not have, but we do 4-H and wild game. And then we package products and we sell them online. This is very preliminary, just launched in December. We do you know, fresh meats, but we also do kind of value added products, pates and smoked meats and that sort of thing. So at the end of the day, we want to reach direct customers and so if my own family's brand we sell to about 350 people on a regular basis where that's how many accounts are are buying and we we run a route up to the flathead and then another that's one weekend and then the next saturday we'll run up to bozeman butte helena and then it starts over and that's how we deliver right now direct to consumer our goal as old salt is to reach is to sell to 5,000 montana families and so we we spent a lot of time thinking about well what does that marketing strategy look like, and at the same time you know we we felt like the certifications and label claims and digital marketing are just everywhere people are inundated that and so we wanted something that would be experiential, and we wanted some something that could actually bring people out to the landscape. It's hard to reach people at scale with twenty person farm tours. And we saw and really appreciated what Red Ants Pants has done, I think, for about 12 years. Um, but at the same time, the festival landscape had become pretty crowded with music festivals. <laughs> and so we decided we wanted to go with what is, first of all, a food festival. And then it, it is complemented by content surrounding land stewardship and conservation and by Western music and art. And so a, a real brief overview of the event that we dreamed up is three days, two nights, starts on a Friday, runs through Sunday morning, two nights of camping, Friday and Saturday night. Similar to Red Ants Pants, we went with a community street dance on, on Thursday night um, at one of the local, well, probably the best bar in Helmville, the, the only bar in Helmville, the Copper Queen. So we were gonna have a street dance there, try to make, make it a main street event free to the community. So June 22nd through the 25th, and then the main days of the festival, the 23rd through the 25th. And picture a 40 foot long cinder block fire where grates are laid over. And the first night we're doing 10 hogs prepared by a well-known chef out of the Portland area. The second night we're doing five beef and 10 lamb. Uh, prepared by um, some, a family that actually originally is from Helena, but has kind of also made a name for themselves in the Pacific Northwest. And then the third night, um, a goat barbacoa prepared by Eduardo Garcia based out of, with Montana Mex based out of Bozeman. And then, so those, those meals are included in a ticket price. So if you buy a weekend ticket, there's three meals as, that are a part of that. If you buy a, just a day ticket, that day's meal is included. To support the rest of the food, we engaged some food truck vendors um, that we liked. And then there's about 14 bands spread out across two stages. Um, the event is kind of, if you can see my cursor, it's, it's gonna take place, there's this little white building and it takes place right at the base of the mountain out here. And two miles down this road is the town of Helmville. You're looking south, um, this way is Helena. <laughs> and um, we thought the Blackfoot Valley would be a good place to start because it's pretty near to urban areas if, if you want to stay and come in for for the day or you could car camp and RV camp. Um, and then in addition to the food and the music, we invited a whole bunch of makers and vendors, mostly focusing on animal products, wool and leather and food and that sort of thing, but also some art, some knives, people who were trying to add economic value in their neck of the woods and their communities. And so we invited them to come free to the festival and they essentially just help us, their role is to help us promote it and to make it a good experience once people are there. Um, so I will just briefly, like this is 
the, the skeleton lineup. It's not an agenda, but it's just kind of what the how the days are broken down with the food being kind of front and center, a big feast each day, and this the music um, complementing it. And then speakers like David James Duncan is a pretty well-known regional author of The River Y and Brothers K and a new book coming out called Sunhouse. And Deborah Magpie Erling is going to tell ghost stories around the fire on Saturday night from the University of Montana. Um, and so there's kind of a literary component, um, a gentleman named Chris Dombrowski, a guy named Bryce Andrews, who won the Montana Book Award, writing about ranching and conservation, uh, particularly the kind of conflict reduction between wolves and livestock. So the agenda is made up of this combination of food and music and conservation based content. We also reached out to a whole bunch of um, nonprofit partners, um, the Blackfoot challenge in our backyard, kind of a natural resources collaborative group, the Montana Association of Conservation Districts, uh, a handful of different land trust partnerships, the Wilderness Society, Audubon Society, um, Kavira Coalition. Stock, and then we that we have some more traditional sponsors like Stockman Bank and that sort of thing. And so um, I will talk a little bit more about kind of the funding structure in a little bit, but this is just a, a snapshot of what the festival is trying to be. We're, we're aiming to host 2000 people a day. If my family doesn't kill me, um, I'll be fine through this whole thing. But that just convincing the, the family that that would be the right target was quite daunting. Um, this was our process, uh, you know, it started with us decide, trying to ask what is our niche here? Like I said, the festival landscape is crowded. And so what is different about ours? You know, one thing that was different was that it was on ranch. Um, but, you know, Red Ants Pants is on ranch too. And so we really tried to make food and conservation the centerpiece. We're aiming for a little bit smaller festival than Red Ants Pants, a um, little bit earlier in the year, obviously, there in late June, trying to hit a sweet spot between fire season and fire risk, given that we're we're cooking on a big fire. And so the end of June is a pretty special time to see the Blackfoot Valley. And um, we, we wanted this, you know, the demographic that instead of kind of the 18 year old um, to 20, you know, to 28 year old typical festival crowd, we were going after more like late twenties to on up. So a little bit older demographic. And we knew that it would be kind of hard to get them with kids and to, to camp. And that's one of our big uncertainties still, this is a first annual. So we have a lot to learn. So it started with, you know, the concept development and the business planning, like how much would we have to sell a ticket for what are going to be the revenue streams? What are the major costs? where would we do this we like i said we selected the blackfoot valley and so the next thing we did is went and asked permission from a lot of people um you know my family's ranch obviously i had to do a lot of meeting with them to get them comfortable with the concept and to talk through logistics but also we approached the blackfoot challenge and we used that as a forum to ask and kind of vet community concerns we showed up at the fire department meeting the volunteer fire department and ems meeting and we knew that, like, especially with a rural community like Helmville, people already have, but just for context, Helmville has a bar and two churches, and that's it. There's a K through eight that has 30 kids in it. Actually, no, it has 15 kids, and it had 30 when I was there. I was the only kid in my class. That's how small Helmville is. And so we didn't want to put a big burden on the community. And so we hired, we decided to hire private fire and private ambulance service. Um, so that the community could simply enjoy it rather than feeling like it was another task for them. We selected a, a festival contractor, somebody who had experience in executing these kind of events. We hired on a part-time basis somebody who lived in the community. She was really, she's the kind of the go-to person locally for questions and concerns the community had and for helping us to just coordinate details and show up at local meetings. And then we we kind of identified from our own team who else will be supporting, creating the programming and reaching out to the talent and kind of crafting the agenda. Um, we are a for-profit business right now. Probably a better way to run a festival ultimately would be to, uh, to create a foundation. You know, I've seen Red Ants Pants do that. We don't have access for the most part to grants. And so as a, because we're running it out of a for-profit for this year, um, you know, we're, we're really reliant on ticket sales and any kind of corporate sponsorships we can get. 
And so that's essentially the staff side of this is basically being funded by our startup budget as a meat company. We, we treated this festival as part of our marketing budget that a startup needs to put in to make a deep investment in, you know, growing the meat brand. Um, the next step was, you know, really developing the program. Who is the talent? Who are the musicians? We engaged with a guy named um, Leif Oysted with VIP Productions, and he helped us reach out to some of the musicians. Some of them were already kind of people that I had in my network. Leif helped connect us with the, the kind of the production and audio side from stages and tents and sound and a sound guy and all that kind of thing. I reached out to my friend Bryce Andrews um, and kind of created a small contract with him to curate the speakers, um, figure out what was fair to pay them, figure out what would be the most attractive format for mixing in kind of poetry and talks with the music and the food side. Um, and then Andrew Mace from our team, he's our head of marketing and he's a wonderful chef. The people from the culinary world who are actually preparing the meals, he really curated them. And um, I sourced the livestock. And um, it's really Andrew's task to figure out how on a 40 foot fire in a whole animal format do you feed 2000 people a day. And so Andrew and his, you know, his kind of partners who are leading up the meals each night um, are in charge of that. There's all the hard infrastructure that I mentioned from the tents that people are, you know, the vendors are, are provide are showing off their products in to the stages themselves to the hay bales that people need to sit on um, to the there's for some of the artists and stuff we needed to provide glamping tents um, there's all kinds of we needed to build a bridge over the canal so we could figure out a way to get car camping to work with with where the RVs are going to go and then the soft infrastructure is what I'm thinking about in terms of uh, insurance getting permission from the county to do a road closure for those several days, working with the local health department to make sure that the way we were thinking about water in and water out and food and cleaning everything was all up to snuff. And then there was a big role in, we knew that marketing as a startup was gonna be one of our hardest challenges. And so some of the nonprofits that, and, and for-profits that we engaged, we were actually asking for some kind of monetary sponsorship, but many of them we were saying, we basically created an asset package of media assets to help promote the event. And then we reached out to these partners and said, would you share this with your audience via your event pages, via Instagram, a newsletter, whatever ways you have to reach out, would you help us in that way? And so in exchange, they're going to be tabling at the event. They get their, you know, their logo is on our website. Um, some of our core partners will also be featured on a panel. Uh, five nonprofits will basically share the, the partnership um, project that they're most proud of. So it's the Blackfoot Challenges 30th anniversary, and they're going to celebrate the fact that they no longer have to do swan reintroductions in the valley, for example, because the population is stable. And so each nonprofit will kind of highlight one of their success stories in that way. Um, there's the run of show and the execution. Um, and that's just like, okay, working with our festival contractor to make sure that from the organization of volunteers to the parking uh, um, and how that's operated on the day of, to the food production, to who's working with the artists and, and meeting them and making sure they're sound checked, that we've got a plan on the day of. And, and then, you know, what are the two weeks leading up to it look like in terms of building the cinder block fire and putting up all the signage and making sure that the road is, you know, accessible. And then the implementation of our marketing strategy is something that that's what we're doing now. Um, at the moment, we've got a couple hundred volunteers sign up. We've, that was, we were super fortunate to have a outpouring of community support for that, but we've so only sold several hundred tickets and we've got a, so we've, we've got a huge steep hill to climb in the last 45 days here before June one, when we're really going to have to make a viability decision. Like, can we actually hold this event or do we need to, say we tried and go again next year and um so in right now we're pushing hard on radio it's gone out in the helena area and now i've got to work it on radio and some other communities we've gone on a bunch of podcasts to talk about it at the event kind of presenting at event, webinars like this um putting posters up and sending them to our friends in every montana community you know trying to highlight it that way um 
And, you know, at the same time planning, you know, for how are we going to, if, if this event works, how are we going to capture content while we're doing the event in a way that allows us to promote it more effectively the next year? Because we, we hope that this can be annual. Um, it is meant to be a, yes, it's meant to be a kind of a promotion of Old Salt as a meat company that is trying to return value to Montana land stewards, but it's also meant to be bridge building between urban and rural in Montana. It's meant to be kind of a, uh, coming together of the conservation side community, people who move here for the outdoors and the agricultural community, people who are stewarding private lands. So we hope that, that it, you know, helps build relationships and bring us, we could use a little bit more political sanity. Um, and so hopefully it will be a good thing for the community. Um, hopefully it will be a good thing for Old Salt and we have a lot to learn. Um, and I think with that, I will just, um, ask for your questions and dialogue. Yeah, awesome. Wow, that's that's really great, Cole. Thank you. It's uh, it's a lot. It's a huge undertaking. It's a lot involved, and I appreciate you walking us through that. Um, anybody has any questions? I, we have one comment from Megan Schultz. She said, "I heard about your event because I follow Brent Cobb, so the word is getting out." Cool. That's good. Jennifer, do you, I don't see any questions yet. Jennifer, did anything come to mind for you? So a question just came in. Um, how did you locate an event planner that understands Montana folks? You know, I don't know that our event planner does understand Montana folks. Um, the, the person, the contractor we hired understands logistics. You know, they run, they run festivals, they, you know, they have the long run of show spreadsheet <laughs> and they're, they're a marshal on site, you know, day of, we were confident that this person and their team um, could really direct traffic and be on top of all the details. But we hired a local person in Helmville as really more of the relationship person who does understand Montana folks. And then, you know, myself and some of the people on the old salt, more like the corporate team, um, have spent a lot of time relationship building with the various different nonprofits and for profits that are involved, the partners. And so we, we kind of used our own team to try to engage Montana folks. And we, we use this contractor and they're actually from California. Um, don't shoot me for that. Um, and they're, they've been great. They came out, they've made a site visit um, just a couple of weeks ago and we've been working together um, now for about eight months to to get prepared but that local person i think was really key for us somebody in the community there's a bit there was a big question for us of um a lot of people that live in the blackfoot valley are pretty glad that it's relatively quiet and they don't want to see it get any busier than it is that's a huge question that comes up in the community and that's why we spend a lot of time going to meetings <laughs> community hall water board um volunteer fire and ems blackfoot challenge and asking people's feedback and trying to head that off. And then now, and then Emily, our person locally, spends a lot of her time just having conversations at the bar, frankly, you know, with people who want to visit about it. Yes. Um, okay. So I, I, we got a question from Jessica. She's saying, she's asking, do you have plans to create a foundation in the future? I think that if we really want to run this every year, that's probably a, a route we'll need to take. Um, the other option would be to kind of partner with a, with a nonprofit that wants to be more of the entity that everything's run through. And um, I, I'm a little more inclined to do the latter rather than run our own, but um, we've got enough irons in the fire that I, I think running a, a, a 501c3 is terrifying. But um, I, I do think that that is a more sustainable model. Great. Well, we know some folks that can help you with that. So if you, if you get to that point, I'm sure you know them as well. Great. Well, it's such a it's a huge undertaking, and I love I love I mean so. At extension, we are all about um, we call it asset based community development. You know, like starting with what you have, what's already there, what's already inherent in your community 
and you're doing exactly that. You're like building off of the wonderful things that are already there. And um, we just, we love that. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any more questions. We have a comment from Deborah Wilson. She's saying at Eduardo Garcia from Big Sky Kitchen, question mark, he's awesome. So we can, um, I shared the link to the festival. So we can, um, you know, when we had, we had Kendra Schmidt on and she started the Harlow Music Festival in Harlow, Montana, Harlowton, Montana, which is 900 people. And um, one of the things that she suggested, she had, there was similar challenges to what you're talking about. And one of the things that she, she talked about was um, having people just, if they believe in it and they support it, buy a ticket. Even if you can't go, just buy a ticket as a way to support, like, hey, I want to, I, I believe in this. Mm -hmm. And so I just put that, it's kind of a radical idea out there, but I think in Montana, um, we have to get, I think philanthropy is, 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 is a, it's a way of the future. And I think um, it's supporting something financially as well as just um, verbally reposting is a way that we can support you too. Shannon Arnold uh, is a professor she teaches a lot of our upcoming up and coming extension agents, and she said she's posted it to her Montana agritourism social media. So that's awesome. Thank you. I very much appreciate any word spreading people are willing to do about it. And um, yeah, the, I, I will just mention the, the ticket part. Um, we've wrestled a lot with the ticket price because I think it feels steep to a lot of folks. And the food element and kind of the format in which it's prepared is the major thing that adds cost. And so, we, you know, it's very hard to sell it a la carte because you're planning a whole animal meal and you kind of, um, the size of that production, the size of the fire and the infrastructure that you need to bring in, um, you really have as much food as you're going to have, you've got it at the beginning and it's gotta be cooking 24 hours before it's you know actually served. And so we tried to just make it an all-inclusive experience where, you know, if you come, once you get in, you know, the meals are, are part of the ticket and your children are, can get in under 10 free. But I, I know that that has been one of the biggest, that's one of the biggest questions we get is, oh, this is a little bit expensive, whether you're at 115 on a Friday or 145 on a Saturday or 285 for a weekend, including Sunday, which is where the, we, we finally landed. That's gonna be something we really have to figure out. Um, I think if people come the first year, um, they will come back, but that's that's the big key. Is can you um, can you draw enough to not lose your butts? <laughs> and I think the the where we finally landed with tickets is best case scenario break even, and I I've not yet heard of a festival that has achieved that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yep, definitely, it's a challenge, and it's and but I I think it's. It's cool to try something new. You, you're doing it, and oh, Kayla M says I'll be there. Excited! So there you go. And thank you. Yeah, awesome. Okay, well, with that, um, cool. I think we're gonna we let's uh, move on to our next speaker. Sounds great. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you so much. If you if you can't if you can't stick around, I totally understand. But um, there potentially there might be more questions. So you, sure. Yeah, yeah, whatever sure. works for you. Awesome. Okay, wonderful. Okay, well, thank you so much. All right, let's move on to our next amazing speaker. We have Shinyi Chian. She is the director of the University of Minnesota's Tourism Center. Wow, how cool to have you on today, Shinyi. We're so excited. Um, thanks to Ben Winchester, our close colleague that we work with a ton with Reimagining Rural. Um, ben Winchester introduced me to Shinyi, so glad to have you. Um, so. So this is the this is uh, Shinyi's life work. She studies and teaches about visitor and festival event, attendee behavior, recreational travel, demand, other topics. Um, she teaches a festival and events management course. If anybody's really interested in this, you can um, take her course. It's you can do it remotely, and um, I will include that link there um, as once she gets started. Um, and I just want to make a note that we have Montana's tourism uh, center director on Melissa Waddell is on too. So I'm glad to see your name in our attendee list, Melissa. So with that, Shinyi, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tara. And uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to engage with you guys and uh, really honored. And uh, from the get go, I want to say that Paul really has made my job so much easier here. Uh, I readily admit my content can be a little bit dry, although I try to bring in the specifics, the examples, but he is the more than perfect illustration. And I am already inspired by his, you know, experience and his talk and I already scratched down my little plan to like reach out to him through Tara afterwards. At least I want to do a Zoom interview and that would be, you know, hopefully can be used for the online course. So sorry for putting you on the spot right from the beginning, but wow, I am really, really appreciative. So um, without further ado, um, Tara reached out to me and uh, we talked about like, you know, what I'm going to talk about. So we'll cover some of uh, the key uh, aspects and, and also concepts about uh, starting a new festival. So first and foremost, uh, what is this, right? And uh, <laughs> it is chart. And the title of the chart is called tourism area life cycle. So duh, am I in a wrong webinar? Am I not prepared? Well, rest assured. Um, so this is the original. And I think it is important to show folks where it came from. So back in 1980, uh, Butler uh, created and developed this tourism area life cycle. And uh, this chart, this model has since been adapted for uh, festivals and events as well. And I'm not gonna drone you out to like at length about what each stage is about. I will just touch on the essential point for each stage. So we all need to start from somewhere, right? So we start off with exploration. So this is the very beginning where folks are beginning to think about creating a new festival. And this is the start of planning to launch, to create um, a festival and a very much in one of Cole's slides, it, uh, the very first bullet point is concept development and a business planning. I will put that uh, into the, the exploration stage. And, and then the next stage uh, involvement, uh, this stage really marks the beginning of the festival actually taking place. And we can say perhaps the first couple of years of hosting a festival, giving it a try, right? So we wouldn't know how well it is going to be and do until we actually go ahead and do it. And then next up, we have a development. And this is the stage where we see a lot of actions, a lot of expanding, building, some more planning. And, and we're likely to see an increase if there is capacity in terms of marketing and a promotion. Now, consolidation, this is pretty much the peak stage, although, you know, the word consolidation was a little bit off, I have to say. And so this is where the growth of the festival starts to slow down. And in this day and age, the slowing down, I would say uh, very much can be intentional because we want to make sure the festival still fulfills its mission. It serves its attendees well. It maintains a high quality experience and it does not outgrow itself. And then next we have the word stagnation. So this is the beginning of a potential decline. I need to make that abundantly clear if we look to the right of stagnation, right? So um, the stagnation stage is also where we could see some negative effects of having a festival. It could be social, it could be environmental, for example, noise. Noise is also a form of pollution. Uh, it could also be community relationship, right? If it is just too much for folks to handle, then uh, it certainly would be a negative impact. Now, after stagnation, there is a spectrum from uh, rejuvenation to uh, decline. And so where a particular festival will end up being, the outcome uh, largely depends on the plans and also actions of the festival organizers and also the festival's uh, stakeholders, right? So if there is no 
um, meaningful uh, and uh, sizable changes that occur, then we can really see uh, the slow continuation of decline, so to speak, of the festival. And so this is all very conceptual. It all sounds very neat. Of course, in real life, uh, it is a lot messier and, and the road can be a lot more windy. So, uh, let's move past the conceptual stage and uh, let's talk about some of the essential aspects of uh, starting a festival. And again, this is where Cole already serves as the perfect example, because again, if we recall uh, one of his slides with uh, quite some bullet points, right after concept development and a business planning, he listed community engagement. When I saw that slide, my initial reaction literally was hallelujah. So I put this front and the center and and I put this even before like developing a mission statement and there is a reason uh your community it is not only your most immediate relationship it is also the most important relationship because the support from your residents public safety folks local businesses nonprofit and civic organizations all these are crucial. And again, in Cole's talk, he uh, listed out all the community engagement work, all the time he spent, all the places he went, right? All for the most crucial reason. And it, it's just not, not just for your new festival to get off the ground. It is also to grow and uh, sustain your festival in the future down the road. And so uh, mission, mission statement. So uh, perhaps you might wonder, uh, really, is it really necessary? Well, our argument is, yes, it is necessary. And here is why. A mission statement might exist on a piece of paper or in a Word document in your computer. Uh, but mission statement, well thought out, well crafted mission statement is your North Star. I'm not asking for academic language, right? Mission statement should live with a plain language that is easily understood. Uh, but the mission statement is, tells us what is the overarching purpose of your festival? Uh, what is it meant to accomplish? And followed with your mission statement, then uh, we need to have, you know, goals, right? And these goals, uh, these goals are needs to be, they need to be measurable. Hence, we have the next layer, which is, you know, more specific objectives. And so the measurable piece comes in when we have objectives, when we have action steps laid out for each objective, so we know we are doing what we are supposed to do, that we accomplished uh, what we aim to accomplish. And after we successfully uh, put together a festival that it's done, when we recap, when we debrief, when we plan for the next one, then we can come back and we can review. We can see if we fulfilled our goals, hence serving our mission. And so going back to a mission statement, the statement needs to be reviewed um, at least annually or biannually, and it needs to be adapted according to, you know, times change, folks change. And so if we want a, a festival with longevity, yes, we need to thoughtfully adapt uh, the mission statement as time goes by. So then uh, we are going into a little bit more um, technical side of things. So market analysis. So it is not marketing yet. We need to know our market, right? So the first item I listed is the so-called saturation level of events. W what does that mean? It, uh, the question you need to answer for yourself is, how many other events already exist in your geographic marketplace? And how similar or different are these existing uh, festivals to your new festival, right? Is there an opportunity? Are there opportunities for partnerships with these other festivals, right? So like in, uh, well, I readily admit St. Paul is the capital city of Minnesota. It is, it is a city, it is not a rural area. Um, but the, the point here is there are like six to eight festivals in city proper of St. Paul spread across the year. And they came together and they decided to uh, cross promotion cross-marketing each other and to leverage each other's resources. And I think uh, there is 
that's a learning piece. And then the second point regarding market analysis is uh, other competition sources, right? Uh, competitors for your for your customers entertainment dollars. So when we say uh, competition sources, it is not necessarily only other festivals or events uh, that already exist. We need to think more broadly in terms of, you know, realistic competition in terms of, again, the, uh, the customer's entertainment dollars. And the next point in terms of market analysis is population composition. So uh, demographics, right? Demographics of your geographic marketplace, demographic of your uh, target audience. And um, there are uh, websites or say uh, vendors out there that can offer free version of zip code uh, analysis profiles, right? So at least you will have some basic uh, information about uh, the population. And lastly, relevant local trends and issues. Well, we do not live in a bubble, so we do need to think through any social, cultural, or yes, political issues that do affect or they can affect um, uh, the new festival or event that we want to get off the ground. So the next piece, uh, given time, I will uh, skip over, you know, SWOT analysis, it really is a forcing our brain, not just yourself, but also your stakeholders, your planning committee, so on and so forth, your key staff to think through what are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats uh, related to your uh, new festival. And again, technical, but also essential aspects. And again, uh, Cole already did the job for me. And so uh, what is your financial situation, right? Uh, this is the bottom line. And the bottom line is important. And we need to be realistic and comprehensive and so that you won't have to confront uh, you know, undesirable situations down the road. And then when will your festival take? take place? Well, uh, a couple of pieces here. One is that looking at the market uh, analysis, right? Looking at your potential competitors in terms of festivals or, or events, you may need to consider how you best to position yourself in terms of timing differentiation. And the other thing is we are Northern states. And so we are highly seasonal. So weather is a very real aspect for us to think through temperature, humidity, precipitation, day length, so, so on and so forth. And then, um, do we have an appropriate site? Uh, there are a lot to consider uh, regarding a good site that fits your needs, the size, the access, parking, not just cars, but also shuttle buses, perhaps bikes, uh, motorcycles, right? And a uh, public works, public health, public uh, uh, safety, so on and so forth. And these are all things we need to consider, which is why for the festival and event management online course offered by the tourism center, uh, in terms of uh, the week module about site planning and management, the instructor of that particular topic is a guru. He owns and operates a company that basically does site operations for festivals and events in Minnesota. And uh, it's just his expertise. And he, is, he has been the one who teaches that particular topic. That tells you all, right? So the last piece, um, certainly, I wouldn't say the very, very last, but uh, I would say the last point on this slide here is manpower. Uh, staffing and uh, volunteers and will they show up at the time they need to show up? Are they responsible? Are they able to communicate? Right? And Nicole talked about having a part-time coordinator, contracting with someone who has experience doing a, executing a festival. And, um, and, and so these are all essential uh, aspects to to consider. And then also when Cole mentioned having uh, 200 volunteers who already signed up, he said something like the, the outpouring of community support. So it really goes all the way back to the first uh, point that I made, which is again, community support, right? So it really comes full cycle. And so with that, I will conclude my presentation, hopefully not taking up too much time. Uh, I appreciate your attention and I welcome your uh, questions, ideas, and feedback. That's so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
um, anybody has any questions, I think this is a great opportunity to ask about um, your own idea or your own. Everybody in Montana, every town in Montana has their thing that they do in the summer there. And, and um, I think that's so interesting how talking about the, um, the life cycle of events and how lovely that Cole kind of illustrated the process that you shared with us today. <laughs> so thank you. Um, we have, okay, so we had one question asking to share the link for the SWOT analysis that you talked about, which is great. Yes. Um, yes. John, wonderful. Um, John is asking, um, that was wonderful, thank you. I've run several Renaissance festivals and you brought up several points that I can do better on. Well, there you go. That's great. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is Jennifer. I have a Jennifer. quick question. Oh. Let's see somebody else just. Um, so, before I get to my question, there's another question on here. I have a community festival that has become stagnant. What would be a good. I lost the rest of it. Did you can you see it Tara? A good way to start up this conversation to rejuvenate. Yeah, a stagnant community festival. What's the way to rejuvenate? Yes, thank you. This is a very good and an important questions. Um, I would say. Uh, first off, it takes courage to acknowledge that. I do not want to uh, diminish that aspect. That's the most important beginning point to hopefully rejuvenation. And I would encourage, um, I would encourage you to get together your, uh, if you have a staff or key volunteers. Um, and certainly uh, your key stakeholders and uh, we certainly Every festival has partners. So your most important partners as well, get the group together. That is considered your group and start the conversation. You can review your uh, mission statement, right? Is it still relevant? What we are doing uh, as a festival now, do these things align with our mission? Should we change our activities or should we adapt our mission? And then uh, perhaps if it fits uh, your needs, then perhaps do a SWOT analysis. And I would encourage folks not to dwell on the weaknesses and or the threats too much. We do a full picture assessment, but the whole point again is uh, the asset based actions, right? So what do we have? What are our needs and where we can look for resources to fulfill those needs? And I would venture to add that if there is capacity, perhaps following the SWOT analysis, you might want to consider doing a so-called strategic doing. We have all heard of strategic planning, but in this case, there has been enough planning going and so we need to move forward from the planning and into doing. And a strategic doing is where we really get down, get our hands dirty. And uh, I, I went through that process myself. So it's like, okay, who is your chief nudger? Seriously. So someone who is going to nudge other folks in this group. We come together 30 minutes every month, for example, to check in. Have we accomplished the goal we set for these 30 days, what's next, right? And at the strategic doing uh, uh, process, we also lay out what we want to seriously achieve in a month, three months, six months, nine months, so on and so forth. So that will empower you, give you the feeling that I'm not just you know hopeless or helpless sitting there watching it stagnant. There is you know concrete steps we are taking so that's my long and meandering answer. Awesome. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, so I will um I will get the link from Dr. Chan and share with everybody. Um Paul, did you have something that you wanted to I just want I just wanted to pile on a little bit to say that um to re reiterate the part about getting your people together and trying to see, obviously I don't have a lot of experience with the rejuvenation part, but the trying to gauge the energy in the room, like is there 
an appetite that seems clear. And like, you know, one of the things that it could really just be about the date. Um, you know, you have to kind of look at the competitive landscape of, you know, is does this event have a niche in terms of what it's offering? But also, man, there's so many things in my neck of the woods that are going on in the state. It's, and it it may just be that you're kind of conflicting with a, a really stubborn event that people are just going to go to. I mean, we, we what I didn't mention in my presentation is that we tested at a small scale this event last year in June of 21 at a very small scale, but we invited 100 people we, and it sold out in, you know, three days to have, you know, an on-farm meal and to try to, and so maybe you could sort of retest the viability of your event at, at a smaller scale as a way of gauging the energy. So just a, an add-on thought. That's, that's great, Cole. Um, you know, that's what they did at um, the Harlow Music Festival in Harleton. They, the, their, their bigger event grew out of their, um, they had music at their brewery hmm. and that it just sort of developed. They, they, they read the energy in the room, just like you're saying, and they, and they built off something that was always, that was already really, really successful hmm. and had a lot of support from the community. Great. Well, thank you so much. I'm looking at our time and we're running a little bit short on time. So I am going to um, thank Dr. Chian again. Thank you so much. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Megan Sunday. And Megan is going to share with us um, a little bit of uh, what she knows about festivals because there's a broad range of them. And I love that. And then um, talk about her funding opportunities. So Megan is with Humanities Montana. Looks great, Megan. Can't hear you though. Looks like you're on mute. Oh, there you go. There. <laughs> um, excellent. Well, as Tara mentioned, I'm Megan Sunday. I work for I'm the grants manager with Humanities Montana. Um, and I'll try to keep this um, as short and sweet as possible. Um, so I don't know if you know about Humanities Montana. We've been around since 1972, um, and we are funded through the National Endowment for the Humanities. So we're always looking for ways to spread the wealth, right? Move those dollars into the communities across Montana, and um, we do that in a couple different ways. But as you can see on my screen, our mission is to um, support Montana's multicultural multicultural communities and we do this through um, supporting anything that nurtures imagination ideas um, specific to montana montanans our history our literature our philosophy and obviously our communities so um, our grant making uh, supports nonprofit organizations sometimes ad hoc groups um, and I'll kind of get into a little bit of that and I'll move as quickly as possible. <laughs> um, I can get this. There we go. Okay, so very quickly, the humanities, defining the humanities um, can be kind of tricky when you're coming from a space of a festival, <laughs> right? Like community development. Um, but we're a public humanities organization, so the idea is that we're taking um, things like history, philosophy, um, literature, um, but we're actually we're trying to translate that into a public setting. So we're that bridge. The humanities council serve as a bridge between what you might traditionally think as a humanities topic or humanities content and applying it to current everyday issues and concerns within communities across Montana. And so we're constantly looking for new projects to fund. Um, and we want the projects that uh, we support to be rooted in, the, rooted in the humanities, which like I said, can be uh, interpreted in a lot of different ways. <laughs> Um, but we do want our projects to be significant to Montana. So we want to know what the benefit to the Montana community will be and essentially how you came to that conclusion, right? Like, did you do a listening session? 
um, like Cole mentioned, went around talking to different uh, community members. That's something we're looking for. Um, and we're also looking for quality program design, which based on the information I've heard so far, um, if you're planning a festival, you're sort of forced to do this. <laughs> so I think it'll fall uh, well within our guidelines and we're looking for feasible projects, right? Things that we know have community support um, that have uh, support from other funders potentially um, and have some, they're looking to sustainability. So the two grant opportunities we offer that I think would be most appealing for um, communities, community festivals um, would be our opportunity grants, which are these um, first one opportunity grants. It's a quick access grant up to $1,000. So not very much, but it could help if you're um, looking to have a speaker or a presenter or um, kind of like Cole mentioned, you know, Deborah Magpie Erling, if she has um, an honoraria request or a fee, this is something we can pay for. Um, and Deborah's actually been very involved with Humanities Montana over the years, um, but we love to support authors, poets, um, any type of professional historians, um, if you're working with a tribal community, tribal elders, um, anything like that, where we want those individuals to be paid for their knowledge and expertise so that we can get more of what they know into the community. Our regular in that the opportunity grant applications are fast, they're easy, the turnaround time is about a month. Um, and so we just ask that you submit it at least four weeks prior to whatever it is you're trying to do <laughs> so that you can actually use the funds before you need them. Um, regular grants are in excess of $1,000. The typical um, award amount is about $5,000, um, but they are often awarded $10,000 or more. So it really depends on your project and where we feel we can apply these federal dollars, which of course, um, we're forced to jump through lots of hoops. Um, we offer regular grants three times a year. The deadlines are April 20th, so I have one tomorrow. <laughs> um, August 20th and then December 20th. And the applications are a little more involved, um, but I have lots of um, resources for you. I, I love talking to um folks about their project ideas, no matter what stage they're in, and I can really help you build a strong application. So here are a few of the festivals that we <laughs> have supported over the years, and I'm not going to get into all of them. I'm just going to say a lot of our festivals have been book festivals, literary festivals, um, film festivals are something that seem to pop up quite often because there's a film and then a post film discussion. Um, film and video and documentaries are a huge um, asset to getting humanities content out into the community, sparking new discussions and conversation about things that are really important, sometimes very controversial um, topics. So this is a great medium for that. But as you'll also notice, almost all of these actually I do think, well, except for Haver, every one of these festivals is happening in one of our major metropolitan centers, right? One of those seven communities. And I'm wholeheartedly dedicated to supporting festivals in other communities. Um, so in talking with Tara, this seemed like a great opportunity to let everyone know that we want to support what you're doing. And um, I'm just going to add to Cole's cut, like presentation, you know, the costs for your presenters, Deborah Magpie Erling, Chris Dombrowski, um, we can help with stuff like that. And I know you're, you might be an LLC, however, other organizations in the community can come in for a request to pay for that honoraria. And there's creative ways to do that. Um, but if we can even offset your costs by $5,000, 
that might help. Um, so those are the types of things we want to help and anything that's tied to um, culture, right? Like think about the Butte Folk Festival, think about Unrira, think about um, the Dino Shindig in Ekalaka. Um, archaeology is a natural science, but it's history in the making. So we love to, we, I want to think outside the box. I want to see more applications come in from smaller rural communities. And where our priority focuses are rural, um, indigenous communities, and um, youth. So if you have anything happening in that space right now, please give me a call. Excellent, um, excellent. There you go. And all my information's there. And, Sweet. Um, there you go. So if you have something, so Megan, it sounds like what you're saying is like, if you think maybe, hey, this might fit, just give give you a call. You're, well versed in asking or talking about if this fits or not and um you i love that you're that's so great because we are mostly rural here at on doing this inspiration hour so we're excited to get this out and i'll post this also we'll include it in the recording that we send out and we'll also include it in our facebook group um we'd love to get some um some of these burgeoning festivals in our rural places. Get some, get them some help because it's hard to make things work. Okay, Megan, thank you so much. We are running a little bit short on time. So I, I, we have Michelle Cushman from the Montana Department of Commerce and Michelle, if you're able to join us, if you can. Yes, uh, I think I'm yeah. on. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Sweet. Great. Um, did I, okay. Start my video. There we go. There you All go. Right. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, Tara, do you have an opportunity to pull up, like, the website, uh, the tourism yeah. program website? Yeah, kind of in the I background. can do that. That would be I can do that. I'm so a little, Michelle, we, um, we, we don't have very much time at all. So, yeah. if we could, okay. if you, well, I'm, I'm sorry to ask, if you could just, <laughs> I, I'm going to pull this up and then, because yep. um, we just wanted to see if there's any last minute discussion with everybody, but I do have your website ready here okay. to go. So, I'm going to share my screen. And you're just going to have to tell me where to scroll to. Yep. Can you see that? Okay. I can. So, if you want to scroll just a little bit further down, you'll see the 1st section that says recovery destination event grant application cycle. Do you yeah. want to expand on that little arrow there? That is okay. all of the information about this funding opportunity that is provided through the tourism grant program. Um, eligible entities must be based in Montana, and that includes a, and, and the event must happen in Montana. Um, and that includes a tribal government, city government, county government, and a primary, uh, nonprofit organization. Also, um, each eligible entity is limited to 1 submission, uh, for 1 event in this grant cycle. The event um, uh, or the organization needs to be the primary organizer of the event, and it should align somehow uh, with the industry of tourism. So each eligible entity could be uh, could receive up to twenty five thousand dollars in grant funds. Um, a match is not required, but there are really really specific costs that can be supported with grant funds, such as actual actual advertising. Um, so that means like, you know, in, um, on billboards or on the radio, uh, social media advertising. So, um, actual advertising cost, the event infrastructure costs are limited to the cost of portable re uh, restrooms and wash stations, as well as 25% of a, uh, facility or a venue where the event will take place. And the other cost that can be supported is signage. The signage is really specific to getting um, attendees to the event. So um, I know we're short on, on time. This uh, grant funding cycle launched on January 4th. Funds are awarded on an ongoing basis until all of the money runs out or <clears throat> June 1st. Uh, currently there is uh, $395,550 available in grant funds left to award. Wow. I believe wow. we've already made a recommendation of funding for about 
oh goodness, it's ongoing. So sometimes I can re cannot remember the number. There's a, I think about 32 that have been funded so far. And wow. um, I have more information on that website. I also have a workshop that is available on demand. So it goes, it goes a deeper dive into the funding opportunity as well as an overview of the application itself. Um, right. And you can hit that green apply now button um, or give me a call at 406-841-2796. Send me an email through tourismgrants at mt.gov and um, we can talk about it. Excellent. That is so great. And um, so we were going to feature this and maybe we still will, um, but we were going to talk about just exclusively talk about this grant opportunity in our um, May program. But I, there's been some potential changes happening at the legislature, actually that are really great for rural. <laughs> so um, we'll stay tuned. We may we might feature this in May, or or maybe we'll have a different topic. I'm not sure yet. Um, but I will include the this website and the contact information for Michelle. Um, and I just want to say this was this this program was um, called out as somebody as a program that's very friendly to rural volunteer run organizations, which is kind of what we're all about here at Reimagining Rural and Inspiration Hour. So I'm going to include all this information in the in the follow up. So Michelle, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it on very short notice. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you this for inviting me. And I like that you think that I'm rural friendly friendly because I am. Love Montana hey. communities. Yes. Thank That's you. That's great. And that is a bucket of money that you have left over to be allocated by before June 1st. So everybody needs to be looking at this. I think. <laughs> great. All right. So we have like two minutes left. Jennifer, do you have any uh, any wise thoughts to bring us um, bring us to the end? Well, I'm not sure if I have any wise thoughts. I did. I have a quick question or just a thought process, and maybe we can answer that in the chat box or whatever is. Um, I. <clears throat> Maybe this is closing thoughts. I, it is um, fascinating to hear. I think we hear a lot of times from our small towns and our communities. Um, oh, I want to do a, wouldn't it be great to have a festival or wouldn't it be great to do this? So we kind of, I don't think we're short on big ideas, um, but kind of that rubber meets the road, all of the details and all of the things and the logistics and all of the stuff, like what Cole talked about is so much that goes into actually planning this. So my question is, or my thought process is, and I don't know if I'm the only one, because sometimes I have to throw this up to the universe and just ask, is there a shorter version, a uh, training, a uh, uh, guidebook or anything that is a checklist that says, hey, big idea in mind for your small town. Here's all the things that you need to consider or to think about. Um, that maybe isn't to the point of taping, taking the online class, like we're not there yet, but here are some things that we need to think about. Because I think as we move forward and we hear from small towns who have ideas or, or are thinking about putting something into action, it would be super duper helpful. And maybe that already exists, I don't know. But it would be super helpful to have something that just was really sh maybe shorter, quicker, um, to just think like, here's all the things you need to think about. And a checklist like, yep, or not so much a checklist, but something where you can say, yes, we're thinking about this, or I didn't even begin to think about um, security or porta potties or whatever. I don't know. Um, but <clears throat> I don't know if I'm the, the, not the norm here, but I would imagine that something on that level would be really super helpful to um, provide some small towns and communities who are thinking of planning an event. So, um, it might be, oh, that would be so helpful, Jennifer. Okay, well, see, thank you. I'm not crazy. There's other people who might think that. Okay. Anyway, because um, super cool. It is interesting to hear um, of all the stuff that goes into it. Fascinating. I think we could have spent two hours just listening to Cole tell us about what they're doing because it's like, oh my goodness, these people have their ducks in a row and they've really thought this out. Um, so, I just think Tara, it's a topic we need more. I mean, I just like what today left me with is I just I want to know more. Um, and I want to hear from other towns and things. So a um, lot goes into planning uh, festivals and events. 
And this, I think, is a wonderful place to start, but again, a starting point, and we, we just need to learn so much more. I guess that's my, that's my parting thought. Yep. Uh, this is Xin Yi yeah. from Minnesota. Um, yeah. I don't think you are crazy. It is very true. You hit it head on. Uh, it is really a lot. Sometimes it is too much, which is why oftentimes our big ideas don't get to be launched. Uh, and with one big caveat, um, I would mention that there is this super brief so-called business model canvas. So it is sort of like a form that you can fill out. It is one or two pages long. It's not a full blown business plan. Uh, you will see like sort of like your market analysis, right? Your customer, your value proposition. It also covers marketing and expenses and revenue sources. However, it does not mention anything about, you know, your site planning and management and operations. Yes, porta parties and, and all that. It does not include any of those. And so with that huge caveat, if folks are interested, I will be more than happy to share this business model canvas. Again, super short, get you started thinking, but you will need something else to cover your logistic, logistics comprehensively. Yeah, if you could share that with us, that would be really great. Yeah. So, um, Shinny, just so you know, we I'll send out a recording and then I send out all the resources that were mentioned. So, um, if you have that, send it my way. I would love. Oh, you've got it right there. Sweet. Okay. Oh, it's, awesome. a, it's a it's a it's a Google Doc, and theoretically, anyone with the link should be able to uh, access it. If it's not the case, make sure let me know and I'll fix it. Sounds good. Wonderful. Okay, great. Well, we're a little bit over time with, uh, which is, which is wonderful. <laughs> great discussion. A amazing presenters. Thank you all so much for taking time to, um, for our presenters to take time out of your day to attend and, and prepare your thoughts and present. Um, thank you for all of our attendees for um, taking the time to uh, care about your community and make your community a better place. We look forward to seeing um, as many as we can next month. Watch out for the topic. It might change. It might stay the same. Thank you all so much. Take care. Thank you.